The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I'm Campbell, director of the MIT News Office, and this is uh, also being uh, broadcast via Vivix because CNN wanted a uh, direct uh, line, and they will be talking through uh, interactively here also. Um, this has just been arranged all in the past couple of hours, so uh, uh, we just got the, um, the signal. <laughs> well, we'll call him up, Leslie. You to go from Brooklyn? <laughs> this is on the record now. <laughs> <laughs> no comment on that. <laughs> so the, uh, the cast uh, here is Chuck Vest, the president of MIT, uh, Steve Lerman, who is the chairman of the faculty, Professor Lerman, Professor Hal Abelson, electrical engineering and computer science, uh, who is uh, one of the leading uh, luminaries on this particular venture, and Dick Yu, the Associate Dean of Engineering and Professor of Ocean Engineering, uh, who has been one of the uh, uh, key people in thinking this up. Uh, Steve Lerman, by the way, is civil engineering. And Dr. Vest is mechanical engineering, just to complete the cycle. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Vest. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, joining us here today. As president of MIT, I've come to expect top-level, innovative, and intellectually entrepreneurial ideas from the MIT community. When we established several months ago the Council on Educational Technology at MIT, we charged a subgroup with coming up with a project that would reach beyond the boundaries of our campus, beyond our classrooms. And I have to tell you that we went into this expecting that something creative and cutting edge and challenging would emerge, something that would be consistent with MIT's mission. But frankly, I assumed, and I think most people assumed, that it would also be something that would be based on a revenue-producing model, a project or program that would somehow take into account the power of the, impl of the Internet and its potential for new applications in education. But I must admit that open courseware is not exactly what I had expected, and it's not what anybody else expected either. But it is very typical of our faculty to come up with something truly creative and different. Let me explain it. Open Courseware is a web-based program that will provide free access to primary materials for virtually every course at MIT. Over the next 10 years, detailed lecture notes, course outlines, problem sets, exams, and so forth for over 2,000 MIT courses will be posted on the web and made accessible to everybody worldwide for free. Open courseware may seem a bit counterintuitive in a market-driven world, but it really is consistent with what I believe is the very best in MIT, its great service orientation. It's innovative. It expresses our belief in the way that education can be advanced by constantly widening access to knowledge and information and by inspiring others to participate. Simply put, open courseware is a natural marriage of American higher education and the capabilities of the World Wide Web. It's also very much an MIT kind of thing. Let me make just a few summary statements about its nature. Open courseware, or OCW as we call it, combines two things the traditional openness and outreach and democratizing influence of American education, and the ability of the World Wide Web, the Internet, to make vast amounts of information instantly available. OCW is firmly at the heart of MIT's educational mission. 
MIT faculty have a deeply ingrained sense of service and mission. They like to work on big problems and, frankly, they like to influence the world. There really is an incredible idealism in this faculty. OCW will have a strong impact, we believe, on residential learning here at MIT as well as elsewhere. Let me be very clear. We are not providing an MIT education on the web. We are, however, providing core materials that are the infrastructure that undergirds that education. Real education, in our view, involves interaction between people. It's the interaction between faculty and students in our classrooms, in our, liv in our living groups, in our laboratories that is the heart, the real essence of an MIT education. We think that actually OpenCourseWare will make it possible for our faculty and faculty in other residential universities to concentrate even more on the actual human process of teaching and the interactions between faculties and students that, as I've said, are the real core of learning. The question that I've been asked most today is, am I worried that the OpenCourseWare program will hurt MIT's enrollment? I absolutely am confident the answer to that is no. In fact, I think by producing this worldwide window on MIT's education, what we teach, the way we think about them, is a terrific magnet, a good thing, giving prospective students some insight into MIT. How will OCW relate to revenue generating educational projects at MIT? I do believe that revenue generating distance education will have a role in the world and will probably have some role here at MIT. It's clear to me that revenue generating areas are out there. Uh, for example, uh, educating and training people in professions who have to keep updated in a very detailed way. I suspect there's a market for some institutions to provide uh, courses uh, in areas like the arts and humanities to retirees who are interested in going back, thinking, learning about new things. So I think, in fact, there will be a market out there. There are a lot of opportunities, undoubtedly in the long term, to make money. But I want to be absolutely clear that there is no commercially available MIT degree. This is about something bigger. What about other universities? What will their role likely be? I very much hope that MIT will be seen as a leader in this new world of education on the internet and the web. We very much hope that in the long run, what we do will in fact inspire and draw other institutions to do the same. We'd be very delighted if over time, we have a worldwide web of knowledge that raises the quality of learning and ultimately the quality of life all around the globe. Thank you very much. Yeah. Questions uh, from any of the panelists? Uh, Jeff, you might just talk about the roles of various panelists and you know what kind of areas that their uh, expertise lends them to. Sure. Um, to my immediate le uh, left is Steve Lehrman, as Ken said, a professor in civil engineering who is the elected uh, chairman of the MIT faculty. Steve has been very engaged not only in uh, the conceiving of open courseware, he's been a very key element of building consensus uh, behind this around the, uh, around, uh, the faculty and has a lot of experience in various forms of the use of the internet uh, in learning. Hal Abelson is a computer scientist, and uh, if I might say so, really a world-renowned educator and a very extremely innovative person. He, in essence, taught the world how to teach basic computer science, but also uh, has been a very thoughtful member of the Council and indeed uh, co-chair of the Council on Educational Technology that uh, led uh, to the con conception of OCW. But 
In my book, the man of the hour is at the end of the table here, the other end, Dick Yu. Uh, Dick is a professor of ocean engineering, also the associate dean of the School of Engineering. And Dick was the chair of the subgroup that really went through the very detailed study that ultimately led to the idea of OCW. And I, so I'm sure they all have uh, lots to say. And if they run out, I'll say some more. Just reaction by the faculty. <coughs> when you first conceived of this idea as a group and the word got out to the faculty, what was their reaction? Um, when we first came up with the idea, uh, none of us were sure what the reaction might be. Uh, since that time, we've gone around and had numerous fora where we had shared the idea, received questions and concerns. And I must say that as you would expect with a diverse faculty of ours, we had a fair number of faculty who had embraced it uh, with enthusiasm, uh, others who uh, are rather cautious but, but accepting, and, and, the, and some minority, I would say, of our faculty who are concerned about what we are doing, uh, whether we have indeed thought through all the angles and, and possibly negative impact on uh, a whole number of aspects. I mean, uh, uh, Chuck Vest mentioned about recruiting is one of them. Uh, uh, giving away something that might be profit generating is another one and so forth. Right? I, I think, uh, and any of the rest of you can, can hop in, uh, there were some very interesting things to me as this group spread out and they held I think on the order of 25 meetings uh, around the campus to be sure that all faculty and uh, some representative student groups had an opportunity to comment. Biggest surprise to me was that the problem everybody anticipated, arguments over intellectual property, were just kind of in the noise level. There were a few people who were concerned about that, but it was not the major concern. The concerns were actually quite wonderful things. They wanted to be sure that we were going to be able to do this at a quality level that MIT would be proud of on, on, uh, on this scale. And they also wanted to be sure that uh, we were going to be successful in providing the kind of hands-on services to individual faculty members that would make this a, a rather uh, transparent and uh, simple translation of their teaching materials uh, to an appropriate platform on the web. Steve, you want to comment yeah, on that? Yeah, this was extensively discussed, discussed in many places, one of which was MIT's uh, Faculty Policy Committee. I chair that committee as chair of the faculty. And I think while everybody has some different views and takes on the details, I think what really excited the group, and I would say with virtually unanimous support from that body, which is the Senior Faculty Governance Committee, uh, came from the, the broader vision that this resonated with what many of us believe is the core mission of the university. The university isn't about selling courses for profit. I mean, that's not what we exist for. That's not why we were created, and that's not why most of the faculty, virtually all the faculty, have decided to become professors. It's very much about how do you disseminate and create human knowledge. And that sort of fundamental value aligned incredibly well with the concept of distributing this globally for free. And that alignment, forgetting all the details for a second, which are serious and important, was why there was tremendous enthusiasm in that group. Yeah, and I think the other, the other issue that people think about is this stimulates real reflection about what it is you're doing in the classroom. If I think about the materials, the materials that I teach from, the raw materials, as Chuck said, being available on the web, forget about the rest of the world, to the students in my class, then what is it that I'm doing with the time I spend with students in the class? How do I, I think about having a real personal interactive experience once I get beyond the idea that this stuff that's on the web page is what education's about? And you realize it's the raw materials, but it's not the education. I just want to also add that uh, a very thoughtful line of uh, uh, discussion from faculty. Uh, there are a lot of faculty concerned that open courseware will uh, take energy away from many of the innovative things that they are already doing and plan to do. And uh, open courseware is not displacing any of that activity. In fact, MIT is committed to uh, continue to be a leader in educational innovations which are above and beyond open courseware. Ken, maybe you ought to yeah. call on people. So, Beth, um, what do you say to a parent who happens to have a 
20 year old. The tuition at the school was announced going up last year, last month, uh, I think it was 3.5%, 3.2%. Uh, with room and board, September, it's going to be about $33,000. Smallest increase since 1970. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> However, this is free wear. At $33,000 a year, that's considerably less. You know, suppose that you ask a similar question, uh, why don't we ban students from our libraries? Do we really want them in walking around looking at all these textbooks and things? Uh, shouldn't they wait till they pay their tuition in order to gain uh, access? Uh, I really want to state that again, that an MIT education really comes from the interactions of faculty with students. It comes from the interaction of students among themselves, learning from each other. It comes from the intensity of the classroom and laboratory experience. It comes from, uh, particularly here at MIT, from a deep dedication to a lot of hands-on kind of learning. That's the essence of our education. We've always proudly shared course notes, mailing them around to colleagues in the country. We publish textbooks. And I just think of this as kind of speeding that process up to internet time. And if I can speak just a little bit personally, uh, I did not go to MIT. I was uh, an undergraduate at West Virginia University. I did my graduate work at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And in both of those venues in the 60s, I benefited enormously from what was going on here, what is now known retrospectively as the engineering science revolution, where the MIT faculty really conceived a new way of both conducting engineering education and practice. And the kind of textbooks, the teachers that I had who had earned their PhD here and then took these kinds of materials, syllabi, problem sets, course notes, took them to those institutions, tailored them and shaped them to their own use, and uh, used them to teach people like me, uh, this really raised the level of engineering education all around the United States, and I just see this as a uh, grand continuation of that uh, tradition. And I've heard Dick make some very interesting comments. Uh, he didn't grow up in West Virginia, but you might just say a bit about how I, you got introduced I, to the world. I had the fortune of coming to MIT as an undergraduate student, uh, but MIT's influence on my life started a lot earlier than that. I grew up uh, in Hong Kong in middle school. And I remember uh, I had, uh, I was a precocious kid and I've exhausted most of the interesting books in my local library. And my father was an engineer and uh, when I was about 10 years old, he brought home some, in fact, secondhand books uh, in ele electrical engineering. I still remember vaguely the, the, how the book looks. And um, I was too young really to appreciate the, the content of the books, but I remember looking at them with admiration recognizing the names of the professors from MIT. And to make a long story short, here I am. And I think MIT's mission and goal is not just to students within its walls, but MIT has a role to uh, students everywhere, perhaps beyond national boundaries and globally. And if I may get a follow-up about that. Sure. Um, this has been out for a couple of weeks now uh, in the Chronicles of Higher Education, I understand. So has that wonderful school at A-Square um, and uh, Caltech and Stanford and, dare I say, Wharton, perhaps, since you also do Sloan, um, have they responded at all? Have you heard from your colleagues? I haven't actually had any conversations with anyone at those, uh, those institutions yet, and uh, I don't know whether they read the Chronicle or, or what. Has anybody else? Talk to others at this point? Only at the grassroots level, not at the, the senior administration level. Uh, I was out at Princeton, for example, and one of the faculty there, actually a, a well-known faculty member in economics, was incredibly excited uh, about this idea. Uh, now, will Princeton ultimately do that? That's a separate question. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's a question of, that. uh, and the answer is I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. and, in, and at some level, I think the hope is that there will be, in the longer run, uh, a growing trend in this direction. I think it's way too soon to know. Uh, I would not expect an institutional response from any of the other universities 
in a short time frame. This is something that's going to have to grow on people. They will have to discuss it among their faculty, with their administration, and come to their own decision on whether this is a strategy they want to follow. You know, just to follow up a little bit on that, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, since this hit the, the front pages this morning, uh, my email has just been clogged. And so far, we haven't received a single negative there have just been wonderful, wonderful positive reactions. Some of those have been from individual faculty, but just saying congratulations, uh, great idea, appreciate uh, your sharing, wonderful thing for the institution to do. Um, we are very much wanting to be first out of the box on this. We hope there are going to be followers, but we very much wanted to be in the lead. And even today at MIT, I think uh, Hal estimated maybe 20 percent of the faculty already make many of the materials from their courses available. That goes on at a lot of universities. What has really set this apart is its scope and scale, its breadth, its depth, that it's going to cover everything we do in the institution, from the humanities and arts and architecture, through science and engineering and humanities and, and management. It's kind of that scope and uh, institutional dedication to this that, uh, that is uh, quite unique at the moment. And uh, while we don't want to get any, into any of the technology of all this, this is also going to require that we do some very clever work in producing the kind of platforms that will index all this material, allow people to move through it freely, easily. So there's a job to be done on a level that nobody else is doing yet, but I'd be awful disappointed if we didn't get uh, some uh, uh, followers uh, in the long run. Can I say what the timetable is for, uh, for posting it, and will there be a prototype soon? Hell, you want to? I don't want to promise. I'm guessing late next fall, or early next spring, you'd see the first couple of courses up. But we're going to be experimenting at a at a wild rate at that point. We do have a goal of getting 500 uh, subjects up over two years. The, I think the other thing is, one of the things we want to learn is what is the effective way to get high quality materials in an economically efficient way. One of the central issues about whether other universities will follow is what's the cost? If this is always unprohibitively expensive, then you won't see many followers. We believe that in its initial phase, it will be relatively expensive because part of what we need to do is create an infrastructure, these tools, <coughs> indexing systems, uh, and processes for creating these sites in large numbers. But the other goal is to create a much, you know, over time, to evolve a very efficient way of doing this so that we can do this without uh, continuing very large influxes of money. Now, with that said, this will, in the long run, become uh, something that will take money, even in steady state. Uh, in the long run, we see that as an institutional commitment. The faculty eventually sees that as something the institution will take responsibility for. But again, it needs to be done effectively and efficiently. We need to learn how to do that. At the moment, has there been funding pledged to the project? We're in discussions with various private sources, but uh, we do not have firm commitments yet. How many people have Well, as, as Steve said, there are a lot of uncertainty and fuzziness yet in the, the cost. Uh, we estimate that during this initial two-year period of putting up a minimum of uh, 500 subjects, developing the infrastructure, providing the service space, and so forth, we're guessing that somewhere around seven and a half million to ten million dollars uh, a year, but there's a lot of uncertainty in those, and part of the uh, uh, the work of the pilot project will be to to refine those costs and understand what it will really take to complete uh, the entire project. If, if, just to follow up on that, if the university can't find outside funding, is it going to um, pursue the project anyway using internal funds? We're going to find outside funding. <laughs> <laughs> Will there be advertising on the site? No. So the, the private funders will do it for anything in return? We believe that this uh, will be funded in a philanthropic manner. 
you know, I was thinking a little bit about this this morning and thinking back into history that when Andrew Carnegie decided he wanted to improve learning and quality of life across the United States, he didn't go out and found a uh, for-profit correspondence school. He created a system of libraries. And I think that I'd like to believe there's still enough idealism and enough recognition that this really ought to be the, bed the, uh, the bedrock use of the capability of the internet and the World Wide Web and education that I think it's an idea that will find uh, patrons and we're, we're very confident about that. Is there a naming opportunity here? Boy, I hadn't even <laughs> thought about that. <laughs> the World Wide Web has already been named, so. <laughs> we, you know, seriously, we, we like this OCW, Open Courseware. Uh, it, it really gives the spirit of it and we've had a lot of discussion about the uh, analogies between the early days in the development of, uh, of uh, broadly dispersed computing and the internet when everybody tried to keep all of their knowledge uh, close at hand and we had very uh, tight proprietary systems and pretty soon people learned that isn't what makes the world work. You open this infrastructure up and then lots of bright creative people uh, write their own software for it and so forth and we think that's the kind of thing that, that should happen in education. I don't know if this analogy makes complete sense to you but I think there's a little bit of the flavor of what we observe in electronic commerce. What the public mostly talks about is the so-called business to consumer e-commerce, selling things directly uh, on the web. And that's growing, but it's really still a very, very minor part uh, at this point in time of, uh, of commerce. But the, what has really transformed business and industry has been the business-to-business -business use, where people share their capabilities uh, around, uh, around the net. And I think that's much more the model that's going to develop in, in higher education. In a sense, we're, we're betting on that. So do you see other schools offering the MIT Introduction to Engineering course, for example? Well, again, I want to be very clear that it's not courses per se that we are putting up. I think much more likely is that Professor X at School Y will like part of the way that Hal Abelson has structured his introduction to uh, computer programming and may use directly parts of his notes or may like half of his syllabus and not the other half, add his or her own materials to it. I think it will be a much more organic and dynamic uh, activity. And just if I could add to that, I, I think the best way to think of it is we hope people, is I hope people will adapt. I don't expect many people to adopt wholesale. Every university is different. One of the places we hope to see adaptation of these materials, particularly, is in developing countries. Many countries uh, have populations that are much younger than ours. Uh, they have large numbers of young people. They are trying very hard to expand their higher education systems so as to build a more technologically sophisticated workforce. In order to do that, they need to add faculty and, and whole institutions very quickly. We hope that these materials can inform their curricula. Many of these people have not had the opportunity of uh, a higher education in a top flight, uh, either a top flight university in the developed world. They, they can find these materials very useful. We hope some of it will be translated. That would be a wonderful thing if universities in other countries where they need to teach in other languages, take our materials, translate them, and make them available for the students as they see appropriate. There are tremendous opportunities for, for doing good around the world in helping these universities, and I personally would be very excited about that. Does that mean you're not retaining the copyright, or is it public domain? Our intent is to retain the copyright. But that's quite different from, not, from allowing anyone to use it. One can retain the copyright and simply say, this is MIT copyrighted, but you are free to use it for all non-commercial research and education purposes. And you, can translate it. and you can translate it. And so that's, at least currently, the current thinking is that's what we would do. We, we would not relinquish the copyrights, but we would simply grant effective use rights to everybody. We have done that in the past with software. There's a number of precedents at MIT for releasing software for worldwide use. 
but retaining the copyright. Are there faculty members that are concerned that if, there's, if their intellectual property is available for public use and they, they have less of an income stream, for example, writing a textbook and selling it on the market? We've heard that, and Dick, you, you, the others may want to comment on that. The truth is, as an economic enterprise, very few textbooks are, in fact, worth doing. If people only wrote textbooks <laughs> financially, <laughs> financially, as an economic enterprise, if you looked at the hourly wage rates of most textbooks, there are exceptions, and we all you know, know of the, the striking exceptions, but frankly, faculty, for the most part, don't write textbooks for the income stream. They do it for the glory and for the good of the institution and their own personal reputation. That won't change. We certainly do expect that some faculty will not put their most recent materials on this site because they're writing a textbook. So I've taught courses where I distribute manuscript versions of my chapters of a textbook I'm writing to my students, but I have a contract with a publisher and eventually I'm going to publish it and those probably would not show up in most cases. You know, there have been some experiments in which uh, various presses, including our own, have put uh, the content of newly published books on the web for free and sold the print book. And the general assessment is that the sales of the print book go up, not down. So, you know, these, we're not too worried about that. But there are some individuals who will uh, feel that way and may choose not to participate in a particular uh, course. Speaking as a faculty person, uh, all I want would be for my material to be broadly used by lots and lots of people and be cited and attributed broadly, nationally. I mean, it, 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 it would be, a, I think, most of the faculty's dream that this would be the case. Any other questions? problem with new kinds of footnoting or new kinds of attribution. <coughs> if they take half of uh, Professor Abelson's, you know, introduction to Computing 101 and and dump the other half when you somebody else. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that's a terrible problem with everything that's going on the web. You're seeing the fragmentation of materials. And uh, I don't know that open courseware has that problem in particular, but eventually the, uh, the publishing world is going to have to solve that. By offering these courses for free, are you essentially giving up on the model that many universities are trying to make money off? Uh, online, you know, distance learning courses. I, I, th I think it's really important to, to say the way we, th the way we think of this is as a publication. We really don't think of it as dis as distance learning, or instruction. Uh, MIT, you know, will do some actual distance learning experiments, as Chuck said, probably around professional education. We don't see MIT doing distance learning on a large scale at all because it, it's just not part of our charter. But open course where really you should think of as publication rather than instruction. It's a major uh, investment for purely altruistic uh, purposes. I mean, do you see the school benefiting in, in ways that maybe aren't purely altruistic? I don't uh, see any kind of uh, financial benefits coming to us. I very much hope that this will be a great success and that there will be a, uh, a positive reputational reflection. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, uh, there is both a lot of idealism in this faculty and also a desire to, to influence the world. And uh, I, I think that that's really at the heart of why the vast majority of the faculty uh, have uh, concluded that this is a good thing to do. We want to have a positive influence. It is in, in most dimensions an altruistic uh, action. But I think it's also true. there. There are real benefits to MIT, not financial benefits, sure. but in terms of strengthening our educational community. You know, we've, we went around and gave presentations in, in every department at MIT, and people would say things like, gee, I would really like to, to be able to see in detail what my colleagues right here in this department are doing. And students are saying, gee, before I, I go major in a subject, I would really like to be able to see what's in those courses. So there's a real, uh, there's a real benefit having this material available you know, even openly across the MIT community. And part of what we hope OpenCourseWare will do is, is strengthen MIT itself as an educational community. In, in conceiving of OpenCourseWare as a concept, the idea that it might very positively impact how we do our intellectual work on campus and how we might impact our students the way they learn, uh, 
is very much uh, an aspiration that's driving an idea like that. So it's it's not purely altruistic. It is it is an advance we hope in the way a university does intellectual business. Other questions? We're running close to our anticipated 145 ending. Um, are there, Monica? Is there going to be a two-tiered system in that some of the materials will only be available online to enrolled students? I, I think there has to be. There are a couple of things that we can't put up. So one thing that we cannot put up is anything that would infringe students' privacy. So things like class lists or names of students or places where there's student work where we don't have their permission, that could not be part of OpenCourseWare. Another thing that we could not put up are third-party materials where we have permission to distribute them on the MIT campus or the MIT web. Uh, those are the two main things. That, that itself requires a two-tier system. As far as what else and the details, well, that's part of what we have to work out. I think the only, I absolutely agree. The third thing I heard when, as among the group that went around, many faculty change their internal website for their own students extremely rapidly. They might do it three, four, five times a week. That's probably not what we want to have happen at OCW. And most OCW users aren't going to want to know that the due date for problem set six changed from Wednesday to Friday. I mean, they just, <laughs> they don't care. Uh, and so there's lots of reasons. And the two that Hal is really more, probably more significant. But we heard many faculty who said, we really need an internal and external site. Other questions? Are there questions from, uh, any links? No, okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate thank your coming. You.